We are so thankful that you have made the choice to tune in to one of ACC's messages. As you're listening and diving into the truths that are being shared, we challenge you. If you're on social media, use the hashtag you belong at ACC if God taught you anything during this message. We want to get to know you. So check out our online community by watching our live service at arundelcc.org live. This is where you can interact with other viewers in the chat, fill out a prayer request, and follow along with message notes. And we believe that God is going to do some awesome things in your life today. Good morning, ACC. How are we doing this morning? Good. If you guys don't know me, I'm the new student pastor here at ACC. My name's Mike. I'm so glad that you are all here. Uh, if you could, if you could grab your Bible with me and open up to the book of Colossians, we are concluding the letter this morning of our 12-week journey going through this letter written to the church in Colossae by the Apostle Paul. Um, if you are new here and maybe you don't have a Bible, you can find a Bible in the seat in front of you. Go ahead, take that, write your name in it, take it home. That's our gift to you. We want to make sure that everyone here has a Bible and that they can walk out of this place with God's Word in their hand. Um, so before we begin today, though, rather than jumping straight to chapter 4, we're going to be doing a conclusion of the letter. And I think what's really important to realize is that context matters. That's point number one. Context matters. And it's very easy for us to read Scripture sometimes void of the context or maybe even not understanding the context. And then it becomes difficult to understand. Let me give you an example. Um, if I were to take your phone right now and I were to find the last text message thread that you had and I were to put the response and your, like the person sending to you and then your response in it right here, we could probably make that say whatever we want, right? Like that's just the reality because we're void of context. We don't know who you're talking to. We don't know what happened before. And we're sort of just going, hey, there's this conversation. Maybe they're saying this. Maybe they're saying this. Maybe they're saying this. And it's very important for us to understand the context as we're looking at this, because we're not just looking at what's happening at the end of these last couple of verses, we're asking a bigger question of what the entire book of Colossians truly about. What is the main point that Paul's trying to drive home with this church in Colossae? In order to understand that, again, we need context. So there may be a map. Is there a map? Going once, going twice. No map. Okay. Uh, that's all right. I didn't know if a map was going to show up. Uh, we had some technical difficulties earlier, but that's perfectly fine. Um, so the church in Colossae was in the western part of modern-day Turkey along the Mediterranean Sea. And it is a church in an area known as Asia, just next to the churches that are in the region of Galatia. So this is primarily a Greek Place. This is primarily Greek Christians that are living here and Greek and Roman citizens. There are some Jews, but it's primarily Greek. And that's very important in order to understand the context of who Paul is writing this letter to. It's a church of primarily Greek people. That's the first thing. The second thing is it's called a church, all right? So we're currently in a church, but it's important to understand what church means. The Greek word for church is ekklesia. Can you say ekklesia? Okay. Ecclesia. Ecclesia means the gathering, and in this particular context, it's the gathering of believers. And this is why you'll hear pastors say, the church isn't the building, it's the people. Because that's what it is. It literally just means the gathering or the assembly of people. And specifically in the Bible, it's talking about believers. So the church in Colossae is the gathering of the believers in the city of Colossae. But there's another problem in our context understanding in the sense that we call them Christians, right? We call ourselves Christians, right? And we would call them early Christians, and we'd say that they're part of the religion of Christianity. Here's the problem. Christianity didn't exist yet, okay? This was written between 60 and 62 AD, this letter, and Christianity doesn't exist till closer to 90, 100 AD. So you might be saying, so then who are these Christians? Who are these early Christians? What are they walking into? They're actually walking into an early sect of Judaism. Um, it is one of the sects of Judaism known as the Way. And that's actually really important. You have Greek people entering into a sect of Judaism. And that's very important to understand. Like, for those of you who don't know, Jesus wasn't a Christian. Jesus was a Jew. 
He was a Jewish rabbi, and he's teaching from the Old Testament. He's teaching as a Jew teaches, and all the apostles were Jews, and they're teaching Jewish teaching. So understanding these are, are really going to help us understand the context of what is happening in this letter and who Paul is writing to. Another thing we need to ask is, why is Paul writing the letter? Paul has never visited this church. He's never set foot in the church in Colossae. Rather, he gets a report from Epaphras, who tells him this is what's happening in, in this gathering, and he writes a letter. And Paul is in prison. So here's the next question. Why, why is Paul in prison? What, what happened? Like, what did he do wrong? And many of us will say, well, Paul was a Christian, and that's why he's in, in prison. The problem is, that's also not fully accurate. Paul is in prison, yes, as a Christian, but he's not in prison because he's a Christian. This is before the persecution of the Christians by Emperor Nero. For a little bit of history, in 64 AD, Nero sets fire to Rome and then blames the Christians and then starts killing them en, en masse. And that's what happened historically. You can find it in, uh, in your history textbooks. But this is before that. So why is Paul in prison? Paul is in prison because he's using certain titles for Jesus that upset certain people. And there are three titles that he uses and that Jesus had that he used. Son of man, king of the Jews, and son of God. Son of man is a messianic title, which just means it's, it's from the prophecies and teachings in the Old Testament about the coming Messiah. Uh, the word Messiah means anointed. And so the question is, who is the anointed that's coming? What's he going to be? A king, a priest, a prophet, a teacher? We don't know. But there's an anointed coming who's going to usher in a new age for, for the world. And so Jesus uses this phrase, son of man, to say, hey, I am that messianic figure from Daniel. However, this is a religious political statement. When he says son of man, he's upsetting one particular group of people, the religious leaders. The Pharisees and the Sadducees do not like Jesus using this title. They go, that's not right, and they get to the point where they want to kill him. So there's a religious political title being used that upsets a lot of these religious leaders. There's then the next title, King of the Jews. And this is sort of thrust upon Jesus. We see this in Matthew chapter 2, when the Magi come to visit Jesus at, um, after his birth, about a year, year and a half after his birth, they travel from Persia, and they show up, and they come to King Herod's court, and they say, we're here to pay homage to the King of the Jews. And King Herod gets very upset, because that's his personal title that Rome gave him. He's the king of the Jews. So when he hears this, he thinks, treason. You're saying that someone else is a king of the Jews other than me. And just a little bit of uh, history here, King Herod has already killed two of his very own sons for trying to overthrow him. So he, and he's about to actually kill a third after all this. Uh, so there's a lot of issues here. That's a political statement to say king of the Jews. So if you think about it for a second, you have a religious political statement, son of man. You have a political statement, king of the Jews. And you're probably going, wait, Pastor Mike, are you telling me that son of God's a little bit more than just literally the son of God? By the way, can I say this? Jesus is the son of God, amen? All right? He's literally the son of God. However, it's also a political statement. Son of God is Caesar's personal title. And this is why Paul is in prison. By saying Jesus is the Son of God, he's making a treasonous statement saying that someone else is Caesar. That's the problem. That's why he's in prison. This is before the persecution of the Christians at this time en masse, and this is really why he's there. And it's important for us to understand that as we go into the letter so we can understand why Paul's writing the letter and what is happening. So let's go ahead and take an overview of what that letter looks like. So turn your Bibles to Colossians chapter 1. And again, we're taking a 10,000-foot view approach, so we're not going to be going super deep. We did that for the last 11 weeks. If you haven't seen that, go on our uh, website, on our YouTube channel, and watch those messages. They were really well done. Um, but let's take a 10,000-foot view approach and understand what's happening here. First things first, it's a letter to the church in Colossae, all right? It's a letter. How many of you write a letter and go, chapter 1, verse 1 of my letter, hello, right? <laughs> like, no, we don't do that. There were no chapters and verses in Scripture 
we added those so that we can reference them easier. It was meant to be read as a letter, straight through. So that's sort of what we're going to do today. We're not going to read it straight through. That would take forever. Uh, well, not forever, but it would be a lot longer than the time I have allotted. Uh, so, um, but we're going to look at what's happening here. So he starts with a welcome, a prayer for Thanksgiving, saying, hey, glad to see you. And then he starts talking about how Jesus is the exalted Messiah. And he does this by constructing this poem that's made of two stanzas where he basically is trying to get the point, Jesus is supreme and Jesus is sufficient. That's all you need. He's supreme, he's sufficient, that's my purpose. And he's pulling the, he's constructing this poem from from uh, places all throughout the Old Testament, from Genesis, from Exodus, from Psalms, and from Proverbs. And he's making this to to make the point that Jesus is all you need. That's the purpose. Jesus is supreme, he's sufficient, he's all you need. At the end of chapter 1, he goes into a little bit of a weird state where he just randomly goes to, I'm the suffering apostle. And they're like, Okay, <laughs> like, what's going on? Like, and it seems a little off to us, but that's because we don't understand what they were going through. To them, it was a natural, a natural flow, which we're going to talk about today. He starts talking about how he's a suffering apostle and that that suffering is not a cause for sadness, but rather that suffering is a cause for joy. You might go, what? Suffering for joy? Like that, we try to avoid suffering in our lives. And he's going, no, this suffering is for joy which then leads him to the rest of chapter 2 where he talks about the cultural pressures that the church is wrestling with. So this is where all that context we talked about briefly in the beginning comes in. Remember, Greek Christians entering into a sect of Judaism. There's two things that they're struggling with. Mystical polytheism and observance of the Torah, which is the law, the law of Moses. This is what they're struggling with. Greek Jew... This is the struggle. As Greeks, they grew up worshiping the gods, a pantheon of gods, Hermes, Apollo, Zeus, Aphrodite, like all these gods. And they're not giving these things to gods to be like, hey, um, we're great friends and you're doing what I want you to do. They're doing these favors and giving these offerings in hopes that the gods won't be as hurtful towards them. It's literally what it is. Like they're doing it to appease the gods in some way so they don't do something bad to me. That's the idea of the ancient world. So when they are told Jesus, that very first chapter, is supreme and sufficient, the pressure is, why would you take Jesus and then throw away all the other gods? What if you're wrong? Is he truly that supreme? Is he truly that sufficient that you don't need to give offerings to the other gods? So they're saying, Jesus and This is the cultural pressure. Worship Jesus alongside all the other gods. This is that mystical polytheism that they're struggling with. And Paul's saying, no, you don't need that. That's why he says all the authorities and powers have been destroyed by Christ through his death. He's talking about those gods and saying they have no power. Jesus is sufficient. He is supreme. You don't need to worship that. Worship God alone. Worship Jesus. That's the focus. So that's the first cultural pressure. The second cultural pressure they're struggling with is as they're entering into a sect of Judaism, there are Jewish Christians within the church who are Messianic Jews who are saying, well, now you need to observe the Torah. Aren't you excited? Now you get to go travel to Jerusalem three times a year for seven festivals. You get to go, all you men, start getting circumcised. Let's go, snip, snip, right? And if you don't know what that means, talk to your parents. Uh, But... (laughs) By the way, that's what I do as a youth pastor. I just go, hey, talk to your parents. They'll tell you. Sorry, parents. All right, so, um, and, then, and then secondly, uh, or thirdly, it's like, oh, and by the way, we got some dietary restrictions, so all that pork, you know, no more. And they go, but bacon. Like, really? This was not in the pamphlet. Like, what are you talking about? And Paul's going, hey, 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 hey. Jewish Christians, stop trying to impose the old law upon them. That's done. In fact, in Hebrews chapter 8, verse 13, it says, That which he called old and outdated must soon pass away. It's this understanding that the old covenant is done. It's passing away. We're now in a new covenant. Jesus' death has covered this. You don't, have to, you don't have to supplement your faith with all this stuff. You don't have to do this anymore. So these are the two cultural pressures that they're specifically struggling with 
which then leads Paul to chapter 3 and 4, where he talks about the resurrection life. And what does it mean to live the resurrection life? And I love this in church. I think we need to hear this. The resurrection life, eternal life, church, it starts now. It is not a destination. When you believed in your heart and confessed through your mouth that Jesus is Lord, your eternal life began. Change has to start. That, that's why we do baptisms. Do you know the symbolism of this baptism? You're dying to your old self, and then you're being raised to walk in new life. It's new. It's not raised to walk in new life in whenever I die. It starts now, which Paul is trying to say, hey, you got to start living that now. So he starts to unpack what that looks like for them. As we talked about the last two weeks, he specifically focuses on the Roman household structure and says, how are men and women and children and masters and slaves supposed to glorify God within this structure in a way that isn't like the world, but is different, in a way that brings glory and honor to God. That's the change, and that leads us to our next point. Change is important. Church, change is important. Dallas Willard says it this way, you cannot have growth without change. It's impossible. Scientifically and literally, it is impossible to have growth without change. And Dallas Willard goes on to say, and this might be a little controversial, he says, people love change. You might go, no, I don't. <laughs> like, I hate change. Well, here's what he'd say, though, because he'd say, ah, you, you say that you don't like change, but if you truly didn't like change, there'd be no such thing as New Year's resolutions, <laughs> right? The reality is if we could snap our fingers and things change, we'd do it, right? All of us. We'd all be like, yes, done. Change isn't what we hate. It's transformation, which is the process of change. That's what we hate. The time we have to put in, the effort we have to put in, that's the difficult part. That's what we don't like. Because if we could snap our fingers all the day, we'd all have, you know, the bodies that we want and the finances that we want and everything would be great, right? But we can't. You got to save. You got to work. You got to scrimp, make a budget if you want to get that, those finances in the right place, invest in the right places, whatever that looks like. Over here, pay off the debt, right? Over here, if you want to get the, the, the body that you're looking for, you got to go to the gym. You got to put in effort. You got to eat right. Like all these things that are just like, ah, I just don't feel like doing that, right? That's why every January, the gyms are completely packed. And in February, what? Crickets, right? <laughs> it's like no one around because transformation, that process is difficult. And a lot of people struggle with that. But Paul's saying, hey, you got to start making that process in your life as a Christian. You got to start living that. And that means that you're going to have to make some sacrifices along the way in order to start living the way that you're called to live. Which now leads us, that's our background, to Colossians chapter 4. Turn there with me. Colossians chapter 4, starting in verse 7. says this, Tychicus will tell you all the news about me. He is a dear brother, a faithful minister, and fellow servant in the Lord. I am sending him to you for the express purpose that you may know about our circumstances, that he may encourage your hearts. He's coming with Onesimus, our faithful and dear brother, who is one of you. Notice that, faithful, dear brother, who is one of you. Remember that. They will tell you everything that is happening here. The reason why this is important is right before this, Paul said, here's a Roman household structure, and here's how you're called to change it and not live like the world does. And now he's introducing this person named Onesimus. Onesimus was a former slave, and a former slave to a Colossian Christian named Philemon. And not just a former slave to a Colossian Christian, a former runaway slave from a Colossian Christian named Philemon. And Tychicus is reading this letter, and I can only imagine Philemon going, oh, what's going on? And all the while, Tychicus has the letter that we have in our Bibles, Philemon, sitting there saying, hey, by the way, after I'm done this, this is what Paul wants you to do. <laughs> like... It's time to live out that life. 
It's time to change. Because Philemon in that day, according to Roman law, had every right to put Onesimus under arrest, put him on trial, and possibly have him not only rot in jail, but possibly have his life taken from him. He had every right under Roman law to do that. And Paul says, greet him as a dear brother. Philemon chapter 1, verse 16 says it this way. He said, do no longer see him no longer as a slave, but better than a slave, as a dear brother. He is very dear to me, but even dearer to you, both as a fellow man and as a brother in the Lord. And he's saying, Philemon, it's time to make the change. This resurrection life means you got to change the way that you view this, the way that you live your life. Don't live it just like the world does. You're now called to redeem it and live it differently. He's no longer your slave. He's not a runaway slave who's deserving of trial. He's your dear brother. Love him. Do you see that? And he immediately brings change into the equation. Which then leads to Paul in chapter 4, in verse 10, introducing some people at the conclusion of this letter. So now he's finishing the letter. Don't worry, we have a lot more to talk about. But he's finishing the letter, and he starts introducing these people. Listen to this, verse 10. My fellow prisoner, Aristocharchus, sends you his greeting, as does Mark, the cousin of Barabbas, uh, sorry, Barnabas, and you have instructions about him. If he comes to you, welcome him. Jesus, who is called Justice, also sends greetings. These are the only Jews among my co-workers for the kingdom of God, and they have proved a comfort to me. So he's sending them three Jews. Why? They're a church of Gentile Christians. So the Jewish people have the understanding of scripture, and he's sending them to them to teach them what scripture says. Because remember, back then, no New Testament. All Old Testament. New Testament was just letters that were being tra traveled around. It wasn't canonized scripture. So the Jews are teaching them what the scripture says, as Jesus did as a, as a rabbi. Verse 12. Epaphras, who is one of you, a servant of Christ Jesus, sends greetings. He is always wrestling in prayer for you, that you may stand firm in the will of God, mature and fully assured. I vouch for him that he is working hard for you, and for those at Laodicea and Hierapolis. Our dear friend Luke the doctor and Demas send greetings. Give my greetings to the brothers and sisters at Laodicea and to Nympha and the church in her house. After this letter has been read to you, see to it that this is also read in the church of, Laodice of the Laodiceans and that you in turn read the letter from Laodicea. Tell Archippus, see to it that you complete the ministry you have received in the Lord. So I want to, and you might have said, Pastor Mike, why'd you read all that? That's just a lot of greetings of people who are no longer alive. Like, what's the point? The point is, look at how many people are involved in ministry. It's not just the apostles. It's apostles, disciples, people, the church. Everyone's given some sort of mission. Church, you're all in ministry. Every single one of you. Everyone is in ministry. And even in this church, yes, we have pastors up here, but we have people behind the scenes doing a bunch of other things. And you guys have a mission to go out and be the hands and feet of Jesus as well. We all have something that we're doing for the ministry of God. Amen? And that's the point there that I want to, I want to pull out of the passage is this recognition of we're all in this together doing ministry. We all have different gifts, and we're using those gifts for the glory of God. But we need to look at this last verse. Because church, I truly believe that this is going to answer the question that we started with, which is what is the purpose of the, the letter to the Colossians? It might not seem like it at first, but just follow with me. Colossians chapter 4, verse 18. I, Paul, write this greeting in my own hand. Remember my chains, grace be with you. You might say, well, that just sounds like an ending to a letter. Doesn't seem that important. We got to ask the right question. See, this is going to be part of our what now, God. Like, what does this mean for us? And yes, we still have point three to do. It's in our what now, God. Because we need to understand, remember, context matters. Why? We have to ask the right questions. Uh, when I was in seminary, I thought I was going to come out with all the answers to all my questions. I came out with none, right? 
Rather, I came out with learning how to ask the right questions. Because a lot of times in our lives, we get stuck in these ruts because we have a problem, but we don't know how to solve the problem. We don't know the questions that are going to help us get to solve the problem, and we ask the wrong questions and run around in circles around the problem, right? This is what happens. We run around in circles around the problem, and we have to ask the right question. The first question I think we need to ask is, why is Paul saying this? Why is he saying to a church he's never set foot in, Remember my chains, grace be with you. Or in the Greek, it's grace with you truly, because truly is amen. Grace with you, amen. Grace with you truly. Why is he saying this? They don't know him. Well, they know of him, but they, they, they're not in relationship with him. They never met him. Why is he saying, remember my chains? Well, what's the letter about? He's talking about their cultural pressures and sufferings that they're struggling with. Okay, here's the next question. Why are they struggling to resist the cultural pressures. They know the truth. It started the letter with, you're faithful. You love God. So why are they struggling? The answer to that is they're afraid of the consequences. What would be the consequences for standing against the cultural pressures and suffering? Remember my chains. Persecution. Prison. This is the result. If you stand against the cultural pressures, church, What's happened to me is going to happen to you. That's what he's saying. But then he finishes with grace be with you. And you might be saying, really? Suffering and, and, and persecution? Is that really? I thought Jesus came to end all that. And I'd argue I don't think he really did come to end it, rather to make it manageable. Let me give you an example. Again, this is the, the Christian church that is Greek but they're in a Jewish sect. So there is no New Testament yet. They're reading different passages. When they hear Paul talk about persecution and suffering, I truly believe they went back to Torah. And they went back to Genesis 16. And let me cue this up for you. In Genesis chapter 16, many of you may have heard this story um, about Abram and Sarai before they were renamed Abraham and Sarah. Abram has been given a promise by God that he will become the father of many nations and that all the worlds will be blessed through him. Here's the problem. Him and his wife Sarai are very old and they're barren and don't have children and they can't have children. But God says you will have children. So they need to trust in God and constantly there's this lack of trust to the point where Sarai goes to her husband Abram and says, take my slave girl Hagar as a wife, not a concubine, a wife. And he does. And she becomes pregnant. And when that happens, we get this beautiful Jewish idiom phrase, which is, there was slight in her eyes. It's this understanding of, she saw herself as equal to Sarai. Which makes sense, because you put her on the same level. You made her a wife, just like you. And Sarai's not happy about this. So she goes to Abram and says, you got to do something. And Abram goes, she's your slave girl, do what you see fit. And this is where the problem comes in. Sarai does something despicable. She abuses and beats Hagar, which leads to Hagar running away, which, by the way, was legal. If you beat your slave, they're allowed to run. They're allowed to leave. They're, they're, they're out of your service. That was how it was back then. So she does what she's allowed to do. She leaves. And that's when this interaction happens in Genesis chapter 16, starting in verse 7. I'm going to be reading from the Robert Alter version. And it says this, And the Lord's messenger found her by a spring of water in the wilderness. Yes, I say water, I'm from Philly, okay? All right, go birds. Uh, I snuck it in, no? Okay, cool, all right, anyway. Uh, by the spring on the way to Shur. And he said, Hagar, slave girl of Sarai, where have you come from and where are you going? And she said, from Sarai, my mistress, I am fleeing. And the Lord's messenger said to her, listen, return to your mistress and suffer abuse at her hand. What? No way. Yes. Suffer abuse. Anna. Suffer abuse at her hand. That doesn't seem right, but look what happens. And the Lord's messenger said to her, I will surely multiply your seed, and it will be beyond all counting. And the Lord's messenger said to her, look, you will conceive and will bear a son. You will call his name Ishmael. Listen to this. For the Lord has heeded your suffering. Think about this for a second, church. If we boil that down, what did the Lord's messenger tell Hagar? The Lord has heeded your suffering, now go suffer. 
ooh, it got very quiet, right? What? That can't be right. That, that's got to just be an Old Testament thing. That can't be a New Testament. That's not Jesus. Well, 2 Corinthians 12, Paul receives a thorn in the flesh, and he pleads with God three times to remove it. He says, God, you got to get rid of this. This is really hampering my ministry. It's hampering me. Please remove this burden from me. And what does God say? My grace is sufficient for you, for my power is made perfect in weakness. What did God say? I've heeded your suffering, now go suffer. John the Baptist, Matthew chapter 11. This is beautiful. Difficult, but beautiful. John is in prison. He paved the way for Jesus. He was the Elijah figure that made the way for the Messiah to come. And he's in prison, and he sends his disciples to Jesus and says, Are you truly the Messiah, or should we be looking for someone else? And the reason he's saying that is John's going, I know what the Bible says, what Torah, Tanakh says about the Messiah. And Jesus responds. Look at how he responds in Matthew chapter 11. This is what he says. He says, go back and report to John what you hear and what you see. The blind receive sight, the lame walk, those who have leprosy are cleansed, the deaf hear and the dead are raised, and the good news is proclaimed to all the poor. Sounds great, right? That's the Messiah. But look what he says right after. Blessed is anyone who does not stumble on account of me. Think about this for a second, church. Why would someone stumble on that? That's all good stuff. Why would you stumble? Because this isn't directed at you. It's directed to John. He's going, John, you know the scripture. Your father was a priest. You know the scripture. And all those, all those things that Jesus said happened are all the things that are listed about the Messiah except one. And in all of those in Scripture from Isaiah and Ezekiel and Daniel and Jeremiah and all the Tanakh, you constantly see this in Scripture. It would say things like, the Messiah will bring sight to the blind and the prisoners will be set free. The lame will walk and the prisoners will be set free. Those who have leprosy will be cleansed and the prisoners will be set free. The deaf will hear and the prisoners will be set free. The prisoners will be set free. And John's going, hello! Set me free! You say you're the Messiah. And Jesus goes, I gave you the list, John. I've heeded your suffering. Go suffer. And now we're all sitting here going, why? <laughs> why? Why does, why does God do this? What's going on? I got one more passage for you. I, there's multiple, by the way, but I don't have enough time to go through all of them. Jeremiah 29, 11. Which, by the way, has led to a complete misunderstanding of Scripture and a complete misunderstanding of Christianity through prosperity gospel, which is not scriptural. And they take this verse, Jeremiah 20, one of the main, one of the main verses, Jeremiah 29 and 11. For I know the plans I have for you, declares the Lord, plans to prosper you, to bring you a hope and a future. And you go, what does that have to do with suffering? Church, I need you to hear me all the way on this. Do not misquote me. Listen to the full statement. Please, stop doing memory verses. Start doing memory passages. Because we miss the context. That was point one. Context matters. Verse 10, right before that, what does Jeremiah say? In 70 years... The Lord will bring you out of this land, for I know the plans I have for you, declares the Lord, plans to prosper you, to bring you a hope and a future. What's happening? The, 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 these Jews are in exile in Babylon, and they are in immense persecution, immense suffering, and they're crying out to God, and God speaks to Jeremiah and says, say this to the people as they're in their suffering, and he goes, in 70 years, they'll all be dead. Why don't we think about this? They'll all be dead. What's God saying? I've heeded your suffering. Now go suffer. Ouch. Right? This is not easy. So why? Why is this all being said? Why am I taking you here? Because of my third point, church. Persecution is inevitable. 
if you truly are living for God in every facet and area of your life, persecution is inevitable because the world hates God. If you truly, and I'm not saying like persecution, like, oh, I made some mistakes in my life and I'm struggling with something. No, I'm talking about persecution because of your faith, because of you standing firm in the truth, in your faith. This is the problem. Because we sit here and we say we want to be more like Jesus, right? We want to be more like Jesus, is that true? Do you say that you want to be the hands and feet of Jesus? Can I get an amen? Amen. His hands and feet were pierced. Wake up. His life was full of suffering. If you truly live for Christ, you will experience that suffering. That's what Paul is saying. However, however, there's still hope, church. Don't check out yet. Please. How many of you have been watching The Chosen. I have. I, I have a contrary view to most pastors. I actually like The Chosen, but I would leave the caveat of it's an artistic rendering. Don't take it as scripture. Always go back to scripture. All right? But what happens in that title sequence? You have all these fish following the current, and then what happens? A fish turns around and goes against the current. Swims against the current. That's got to be hard. That's harder than going with the current. And what happens though? That fish swims against the current and another turns and another turns and another turns and another turns. This is what we're called to do. We're called to be the example. That when we stand against the world, we stand against culture, we stand against these pressures that are, that are not of God and live the way God lives, people see that and they turn to him. That's the goal. That's Christianity. And far too often, we use the, ah, I don't want to force my religion on someone. I don't want to make it awkward. I just, maybe I just don't know what to say. I'm like, okay, well, you don't know what to say. Well, the Spirit apparently is in you if you're a Christian, so let him speak, one. Two, come on. This is what God put you here for. Remember I said we're all here for ministry? Think about this congregation for a second. Think about how many people this congregation touches every week. In your workplace, at your school, at, at, your, at your activities. How many people you see. Do you realize that we exponentially reach so many more people as a body? So why aren't we being the hands and feet? Why aren't we being the example? Church, this is why 12, by the way, teenagers, Jesus' disciples were teenagers, 12 teenagers changed the world. But a congregation of like 12,000 barely touches its community because they're not willing to be the example. And yes, we do these things. We, we do the boxes, and you should. We do things to touch the community. But the question is, are you touching your community? The people you're with every day at work. Are you the example? Do they know you're a Christian? Or do you act differently when you walk through these doors than when you walk through the doors at work? You know what Paul would call that? Being ashamed of the gospel of Christ. And that's not a judgment. That's the truth. Because church, I struggle with this too. I'm not perfect. I struggle to stand for God at times too. That's why I got these tattoos. To remind myself, am I being a good example of Christ right now or not? Because I have done things in my life that were not glorifying to him, and I need that reminder too. We all need it. I'm not saying go get tattoos. But (laughs) for the kids out there, they're going, yes, no. (laughs) All right. But persecution is inevitable when you live for God in every area of your life. And Jesus actually starts his ministry this way. Turn with me to Matthew chapter 5. This is where we're going to close. In Matthew chapter 5, we call this the Sermon on the Mount because Jesus is teaching on a mountain. It's actually never called Sermon on the Mount. It's just he's teaching at a mountain, and we call it Sermon on the Mount. But at the very beginning, this is the very first public teaching that Jesus ever gives. And in this teaching, he starts with this in verse 3. Listen to what he says. Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are those who mourn, 
for they will be comforted. Blessed are the meek, for they will inherit the earth. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they will be filled. Blessed are the merciful, for they will be shown mercy. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they will see God. Blessed are the peacemakers, for they will be called children of God. Blessed are those who are persecuted because of righteousness, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. And blessed are you when people insult you, persecute you, and falsely say all kinds of evil against you because of me. Rejoice and be glad, because great is your reward in heaven, for in the same way they persecuted the prophets who were before you. And I bring you to this because this is the very first thing Jesus ever says in public as a teaching before he goes into this beautiful teaching of all these things that need to change in life. But unfortunately, again, what was the first point? Context matters. Because a lot of times we read this word blessed that's constantly showing up, and we think of blessing. And we think of, oh, hey, so when I am this, someone will bless me. Who's that someone? God. Here's the problem, church. That's not what that word means. The Greek word there is makarios, which comes from the root word that means happy. It's not a transactional statement. It's not a, if I am this, then I will be this because God does something for me. It's, hey, I'm happy constantly. It's a state of being. So a better interpretation of that word, makarios, is a phrase like, you will be living your best life when, or better yet, you will be truly content when you are. Now look at Matthew chapter 5. You will be truly content when you are poor in spirit, for yours is the kingdom of heaven. You will be truly content when you mourn, for you will be comforted. You will be truly content when you are meek, for you will inherit the earth. You will be truly content when you hunger and thirst for righteousness, for you will be filled. You will be truly content when you are merciful, for you will be shown mercy. You will be truly content when you are pure in heart, for you will see God. You will be truly content when you make peace with others, for you will be called children of God. You will be truly content when you are persecuted because of righteousness, for yours is the kingdom of heaven. And listen to this, church. You will be truly content when people insult you, persecute you, and falsely say all kinds of evil against you because of me. Rejoice and be glad, for great is your reward in heaven, for in the same way they persecuted the prophets who were before you. So what's Jesus trying to say? He's saying it's not this transactional statement. It's not when I am this, God's going to bless me, so I this. It's I recognize what Jesus is saying. Jesus is listing all these things that in that day were seen as God's clearly not with you. If you're mourning, if you're persecuted, if you're struggling, like these are clearly not God on your side. This is clearly you're doing something wrong. And Jesus goes, well, that's the problem. You misunderstand what it means to be good. Romans chapter 28, sorry, chapter 8, verse 28 says, God works for the good of those who love him. If I were to, and this is another passage taken out of taking out context, because if I were to ask you what's good, you'd say, well, good is um, my, my bills are paid. I got a savings built up. I paid off the mortgage on my house. My, my food and pantry are full. Uh, I, I'm in a position where I can retire early. This is great. This is good. Basically, what you're saying is abundance. Church. Jesus is trying to teach us. Paul is trying to teach us that true contentment does not come in abundance. It does not come with having everything. Rather, true contentment comes from having nothing but God. That's true contentment. And when you recognize that, it is so much easier to stand up against the persecutions around you because your state of being has changed. Your eyes are set on a different goal. You're set on God, not the world. 
And so when you enter into states of mourning and enter into states of grief and enter into states of troubles and persecutions and difficulties, you can do what Paul said in 2 Corinthians 12, I will delight all the more gladly in, the, in, in my insults and hardships and persecutions and difficulties. For when I am weak, then I am strong. Why? Because I'm doing what God's called me to do. Church, persecution is inevitable. But when you set your eyes on God, it's so easy to walk through it because you recognize that what you're doing is what he's called you to. You're standing against the culture. You're standing against the world. You're standing for him. You're truly being the hands and feet of Jesus. And yes, you might be pierced, but they pierced him. They pierced the prophets before him. They're going to pierce you too. But God gives you strength. God gives you purpose. God helps you walk through it. Far too often we forget this. So church, as I conclude today, as we conclude the whole point Remember, whole point of Colossians, remember my chains, grace be with you. Remember my suffering, that's the call, to stand up against the world and live for God. You will suffer, but grace will be with you because you're doing what God has called you to do. And you're being the example and going against the current. And people are following and coming and knowing God because of you. That's the goal. So if you're new here today, after I pray, I would like you to come forward over here with your Connect card and just listen to who we're about in five minutes. But the And this is for everyone too, including the new people. We have made room up here, more room, because we recognize the importance and power of prayer. Church, do not... If you haven't listened to anything I've said, listen to this. Do not try to do this alone. You were not meant to do this alone. God meant you to do it as the ecclesia, the gathering of believers, together. Galatians 6, 2, Paul says, carry each other's burdens, and in this way you will fulfill the law of Christ. We're called to do this together. I'm inviting up all of our overseers, all of our pastors, all of our prayer team, come up here, and they're going to be here to pray with you. If you're struggling to stand against the cultural pressure, if you're struggling to live the way God has called you to live, come receive prayer. There's no judgment because we're all struggling with it too. We recognize that. And here's the truth, church, that the enemy doesn't want you to believe. Every single person here needs prayer. Period. There's no exception to that. We all need it. I encourage you to use this time this is for you, to come and receive prayer, to receive hope, to receive encouragement, so you can go and be the hands and feet of Jesus to this broken world. Let's pray. Dear me, Father God, I just thank you for who you are. And Lord, I pray that as we conclude this service, God, Lord, I pray that no one walks out these doors unchanged. God, I pray that you stir in their hearts to have some growth in their life, to change and become more like your son. Give them the courage, God. Give them the strength. Help them to see your will and your way in their life. God, we praise you because you're so good. You're so good. And we don't deserve it. Father, I just lift up every person in this room, every person watching online, every person who couldn't make it this morning. God, I pray that your spirit be with them that you reveal to them the true intentions of their heart and convict them, God, to see your way. And that's for me too, God. Help me to see your way. Lord, we humbly submit to you. We pray it's all in your son's holy and blessed name and all of God's people said, amen. Wow, we are so thankful for the truth that was shared in the message today. Please know that we as a church are praying that what you have learned today and the truths that God has put deep into your heart will manifest and grow into something amazing. You can experience that with other believers at ACC on Sunday mornings at 710 Aqua Heart Road. And remember, you belong at ACC.